it started with the bike lane and then I decided to add in, you know, some landscape architecture, just just some sort of design that could really reimagine the, the corridors as something more you know, bicycle and pedestrian friendly than, than what we have today. Because short term solutions are great and a lot of cities are employing them because they're so easy to get out there. But obviously the long term goal is to have you know, what, what the Dutch have, having separated bike lanes on the sidewalks and, and bike signals and all those, you know, wonderful amenities that we, we can really have to transform our streets because we can make streets more bicycle friendly in the short term, but you don't really get the added benefits like landscaping that come from, you know, complete streets and, and Dutch style street design that we, that we really want to see. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Town Channel. My name is John Zimmerman, and that is Petru Sofio from Arlington, Massachusetts, in the Cambridge, Somerville area, right there in Boston. And we're going to be talking about uh, how he got passionate about transportation, signal engineering, all that good stuff, and uh, and and. If I haven't already mentioned it, uh, yeah, he's a senior in high school. <laughs> Let's get right to it with Petra. Petru, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Welcome. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. Petru, I love uh, having my guests just say a few words about themselves. So uh, in a nutshell, who is Petru? So I'm in, you know, I live in Arlington, Massachusetts, and I'm actually a high school student. I'm very passionate about transportation and always have been, um, even since I was young. Um, I feel very deeply that everybody should be able to get around in every mode they, they, they choose. And I'm also, you know, very interested in transportation engineering and design, especially of traffic signals. So I like to get to the nitty gritty of, of engineering designs to try to see how we can make things better for pedestrians, bicyclists, you know, everybody that uses our streets, all, all modes and abilities. And yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you mentioned in passing there that you were a high schooler, you are. So, and you also mentioned when I was young, well, you are still young, <laughs> but <Yeah. laughs> to your point, um, yeah, absolutely. Ch check this out. So this, you uh, sent this along. This is a drawing you did when you were, I'm assuming much younger. Yeah. I think I was about seven or so when I, when I did this. So uh, I always would, you know, I would love to use printer paper and just color away drawing traffic signals um, you know, and a lot of my, you know, drawings, like the first, um, grouping of sentences I learned how to spell, I think I was five or so is actually no turn on red, um, because I would be drawing traffic signals. Um, and I was like, Oh, what's that sign? Cause you know, we're lucky in Massachusetts to have a lot of no turn on red signs. Um, so I would always see them on traffic signals and wanted to put them in my drawings. So, um, that's what you see in this, in this photo. <laughs> I know. And, and in your background too, and clearly yeah. <laughs> you are passionate about the, uh, the no turn on red, uh, aspect of it. Any idea what kind of prompted that, uh, you know, that passion for no turn on red? I think first for me it was just, you know, it was just a symbol of traffic signals. Um, when I was younger, um, then, you know, I started running and biking a lot in 2020. Um, and I actually, you know, got hit by a car, not at a turn on red intersection, but it was a right turning vehicle who was over the crosswalk and I ran in front of them. I mean, I was only 14 and, you know, they turned without double checking for pedestrians and I was on their hood. I wasn't hurt. I was able to walk away. So I was very lucky that it was not an SUV or, or truck or something like that. But uh, it definitely, you know, drew me aware to like the danger that that right turns on red and turns on red in general pose to, you know, bicyclists and, and pedestrians. Um, and to me, as like somebody who's interested in traffic signals, it seemed wrong that anybody would be able to, you know, diso disobey a traffic signal, even to turn right. It just doesn't make sense if we already have this safety device installed that if you're turning right, you should just have to wait. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's what's interesting too about your story and, and as a runner myself, I've, I've had plenty of those types of interactions with, uh, with vehicles that, uh, are turning right. And, and you're absolutely correct. They're, they, as drivers, they're looking to the left. They're looking for, you know, oncoming vehicles. And so they're like, Oh, I've got a gap or it's clear for me to do. And they're already turning by the time they're like, Oh, and then Petru's right there or John's right yeah. there. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's, it's just very unexpected because, you know, sidewalks are two ways. So, you know, you, you have to cross that. Um, and that's becoming an issue with bikeways too, as, as we have more separated bike lanes that are two directional. 
Yes, exactly. But the other thing that you mentioned, two things, is uh, because the speeds are were and typically are relatively low, oftentimes it's either a near miss or if it is a collision, it's not a fatal or serious collision. But to your point, you made the clarification that it's a good thing it wasn't a huge SUV because it may not have been the same uh, outcome because you ended up on on the, the hood. And uh, I can remember quite a few taxi cabs in Chicago that I would smash my fist down on their hood when they did that to me. And they were right, be right. startled. And I'm like, yeah, you need to first look this way, dude, before you turn. So, yeah. So good point. Uh, a, low speed, so good outcome in that sense, but also uh, – fortunate that it wasn't a a big huge behemoth of a vehicle exactly yeah thank goodness (laughs) yeah yeah, yeah. absolutely so you and i have have never met but we have been uh connected through social media uh for the better part of a year or more because you're also very very active out on social media and you know conversing and talking. And then inevitably your name comes up in other interviews that I've done. Like your name came up in the episode that I was recording with Megan Ramey. And she's like, oh yeah, Petru's awesome. He did this great diagram work for me. So you're like so passionate about this stuff that you're not, it's, it's beyond just, you know, what you saw when you were doing this, you're doing some formalized work now too. And you're, you're like actually using SketchUp and other types of programs. I'm sure really getting into this is your intention to, to eventually go on and study in college, uh, to become a transportation engineer, a general engineer, or what's the direction that you're hoping to head? Yeah, I'm, um, so I'm a senior in high school, so next year I'm going to be going to college, and I'm majoring in civil engineering, and that will be really exciting, you know, just to, you know, my goal eventually is to be a, a traffic engineer, which I know is, is controversial to a lot of people, um, because there has been a lot of harm done in the past, but I, I like to think about it, you know, we have a new wave of planners, we can have a new wave of traffic engineers too, and, you know, I would always prioritize people's pedestrian safety and bicycle safety, when looking at that, I've also had an opportunity to do several internships, most recently over the summer at Tool Design Group, which is you know a great firm. Um, and in those internships, I was able to learn more about traffic signal engineering and get to work on a couple of projects, too. So that was really exciting. Yeah. And uh, one of my recent uh, interviews was with Stefan Baer, who uh, is classically trained, um, you know, civil engineer. And then he, you know, made the point and he actually wrote an article about this is that, you know, in North America, in the United States, we don't really even have true traffic engineering. It's like, you you know, you, you basically become a civil engineer, you get that training, you may get a few classes and coursework in, in transportation and traffic, et cetera. And he kind of, you know, identifies the point as he then went to the Netherlands and is now working for the city of Harlem in, in the Netherlands. Uh, and, and really the, that formalization of, uh, the types of study and the types of work that they're doing, uh, to really hone in on, uh, you know, trying to create an environment where that is multimodal, you know, and supports people exactly. walking, yeah. biking and all these other things. And, uh, it, it, the fact that you're, you're so interested in signalizing and signalization, uh, that's one of the great things that I think that they do very, very well over there is the, the signal phasing and signal timing that really helps make it easier for people walking and biking because really, you know, it's at that intersection where you're most vulnerable as a person walking or biking. And, uh, if, if you've got the engineers the, the, and the traffic engineers and the signalizing technicians that are like honing in on, Oh, by the way, we can have the power to really help make this easier for somebody on a bike or, or walking to be able to make it to their destination successfully. Absolutely. Yeah. I've, I've, I've been to the Netherlands once and, you know, I would just watch the traffic signals just for 15 minutes, an hour. 
they were so interesting. The way they, they operate is fully actuated. That's the um, like technical term. So that means that they basically operate based on what's happening at the intersection in real time. It's not pre-timed at all. So if a pedestrian comes up and they hit the button, they'll get a walk sign as soon as possible. So you don't have to wait around you know, like you do in the United States where we're often just waiting for vehicles that just aren't there. And it's extremely frustrating and it, it really hurts our, our compliance at traffic signals because when drivers you know, see, oh, why am I waiting for this pedestrian that doesn't exist or this driver, this car that's not here, like why am I waiting at this no turn on red sign and then they'll just turn and then that behavior is normalized. So once we have smarter signals, I think we'll have better drivers too. Yeah. And, and to your point too, is, you know, people who are riding bikes, bikes are not motor vehicles, you know, being able to keep your momentum up and continuing to, to travel at bicycling speed, you know, you know, 10 to 15 miles per hour or so at a very relaxed pace is essential for being able to, to get around to meaningful destinations. And so one of the great things that, uh, the, the Netherlands is really working on and, and I, Notice this when uh, Bicycle Dutch and I, Mike, Mark Wagenber, um, he had his app turned on uh, that was interacting with the, the the traffic signal situation when we were doing a, a tour of, of his hometown there in Den Bosch. And uh, it was wonderful because there was that additional sort of anticipation, as you're mentioning, it's, it's like, it's, it's anticipating that we are actually cycling towards that intersection. And it, it gave us the ability to actually successfully make it through many of those intersections because it actually knew that we were getting there, uh, even before the traditional sort of actuation period, which was, would be a loop in there. It was even earlier because it was a, an app, uh, based system. So really fascinating what we can have for the future. Yeah, absolutely. And it's really inspiring to see that that type of work. I know Cambridge and, and New York City and a couple other municipalities are experimenting with what's called a bicycle green wave, which yes. is where the signals are set for, you know, a speed that's that's, you know, reasonable for cyclists, maybe twelve miles an hour, eleven miles an hour. And that really, you know, you feel really prioritized when you bike on a on a green wave in green wave because you just are not stuck at red lights, you know, you can just continue through and you see the drivers stop. And then they have to start again. And that's good for them, too, because it makes them drive slower. So, yeah, really, really good. Now you just mentioned Cambridge. And of course, uh, you are actually uh, in Arlington, which is really close to Cambridge and also Somerville. And uh, we have a few images uh, of some intersections and some fun stuff that you were working on. Uh, why don't you guide us through this whole series of photos here and uh, why you sent them along? What you want, what you wanted to talk about? And, uh, and you can just guide me. You can say, yeah, next image and, and I'll, I'll shuffle it through. Sounds good. So this is the Massachusetts Avenue and Appleton Street intersection in Arlington. This is, you know, about a two minute walk for me. It's very close by, right in my neighborhood. Um, and in the pandemic, you know, I was biking a lot of friends and, you know, I would bike through this intersection to get to the local bike trail. And, you know, in May, there was a cyclist that was biking through this intersection and they were struck by a driver turning left and killed. And once that happened, you know, I don't know what it was, but I really felt upset about that. It just felt really scary that, that someone like died like that. And that was kind of how I got into, you know, formal bicycle advocacy in a way and, you know, wanting to really better, better my community. So as you can see, this intersection, it's, it's got these really strange traffic signals that, you know, they aren't really traffic signals, but if you click a button, then they turn red for you to cross the street, but otherwise they're not. It operates like a normal intersection, and it's super wide. There's just an abyss of, of pavement. It's a very odd intersection. So people just used to fly up that up that left turn, you know, really going 30 miles an hour and trying to get up the hill, and, and you know, it just was a really dangerous situation. So if you go to the next slide, once that fatality happened, the town kind of looked at it with a lot of pressure from advocates, you know, seeing what, what was done in Cambridge and saying, hey, we really need to make this better. So this was a photo I took of a trial that the town did to make the intersection safer in a really short term. So they put these curb bump outs out and if you go to, and you can see people cycling already feel a little bit safer. If you go to the next slide. So this was, you know, one of the designs and this was one of the first designs and you know, I was new to the to the advocacy side so I I, you know, went into it, it was like, "Oh, okay, everybody's going to be for this. Like it's going to be great and we're going to get a safer solution." But, you know, as it often is in America, there was a parking loss and that was really controversial to people in the neighborhood. And I suddenly, you know, quickly learned that, oh, so 
I guess there are other priorities beyond safety in traffic engineering in you know politics as well. Yeah, yeah, crazy. Yeah. So as we went on, the, the design got altered into you know this, which is uh, there's a block still of the shared lane markings, and oh, my cat is deciding to join us. Oh, good. Um, yes. Apologies. Yeah. No. No. Uh, that's, don't apologize. The, that's that's uh, we uh, we enjoy and and frequently have uh, feline guests on the uh, on the show. <laughs> yes, Wednesday likes and to dogs be in the too. Sun, Sorry, so. canines. Yes. <laughs> um, but if you go to the next slide, you know this design was actually. You know, installed, and I came out to watch it. You know, being painted, and this is a photo I took right next to the the ghost bike of Charlie Proctor, who was you know unfortunately killed at this intersection by a driver, and it never should have happened. And and the intersection was redesigned in 2015, you know, with a repaving project and something like this. You know, I wish happened so there wouldn't have been this tragedy. And so it's really sad that it took this long. But if you go to the next slide, you can just see, you know, how much safer, you know, it's really unfortunate that we're that in America, we're having to, you know, there's, it's often a process, you know, we start at a tragedy and that's how our roads get safer. And I think that after this, Arlington is starting to learn to proactively build this, the safety improvements that we need, you know, as vision zero communities. So it's in one hand, I'm really happy that the safety improvements were installed. And on the other, it's really tragic that someone had to die before, you know, this intersection could get safer because people have been saying it's been dangerous for years and, and nothing ever happened until this, this tragedy. How much has, you mentioned it, I think in, in passing there, um, how much is being in the close proximity to Cambridge and Somerville that have, are two communities that have really been, I think, pushing the, the edges and pushing the limits and really working hard to create safer places. And I like to say that I think Cambridge is in particular has been like really even pushing across the river, you know, Boston to, to get with it and get moving. Uh, how much influence is that on, on your town in, in terms of like, oh yeah, we, we can see that there's a better way to do this is I'm assuming that's influencing you guys as well. Absolutely. I mean, the, the dichotomy is enormous. Like, you know, I believe when, when, when this, the, our select board, which is the, the voting board for our town, was deciding on this plan that removed, I think, you know, less than half of the parking spaces, and it was not approved. The same night, Cambridge had a meeting where they were on a much long, longer stretch of the same street, planning on removing all of the parking on the street to add in protected bike lanes. So seeing that, you know, was really, you know, on one hand, I'm really excited for Cambridge that they were able to, to do that project, you know, preemptively before anybody died to, to make the, the corridor safer. But also, you know, it really showed us like, wow, OK, we can't even remove a couple parking spaces that aren't really being used when someone died. Um, so I think that in that way, you know, it kind of keeps people, you know, it's it allows us to see them as a role, a role model. And it also allows community members who maybe are suspicious of bike lanes to to you know, check it out, and they're able to to see see the improvements. One of our select board members, um, select board um, selectman Eric Helmuth, um, he actually you know now rides his e bike, and he's gone through Cambridge, and he sees the protected bike lanes, and and now he's become one of our strongest um, champions for for safer streets in Arlington. So I think that having them close by it makes it makes it extra doable. You know, we have also we also have constraints like snow. And other and other you know issues like that, and people would say, well, how are we going to deal with the snow? You can't put in bike lanes because they're not going to be able to plow it. And we can just look to Cambridge because they've already done it for us. Yeah. So it's really really powerful to have that type of role model. And I think that they definitely influence you know the community, especially because we have such small towns and, and cities in Arlington and are in Massachusetts, so that people you know if it's safer to bike in Cambridge then people, more people are going to be biking in Arlington too. You know, there's that effect. And then once we have more bicyclists, we need to protect them as well. So, yeah. Cause I mean, when you really think of it, I, I remember riding in the area and I'm like, I'm filming down Western Avenue and uh, you know, it's, and by the way, you know, that's a great example of where they were able to uh, put, in, put in a protected bikeway and retain some parking in that area. So it became a par parking protected, but the bike lane is also up at the same level as the pedestrian realm. And so they were able to do continuous sidewalks and continuous uh, crossings of the, the bicycle path 
the bicycle lane through the minor intersections. But what was really interesting uh, for me riding around that area is I'd be like riding along and like, oh, wait. I'm in Somerville now. <laughs> so because you, you, you all are very, very close. I mean, when we're talking about, you know, the distances between your town and Cambridge, I mean, it's, you're very, very close. Right. Yeah. I think Arlington's only about six square miles and, and Cambridge is, is around that same size, maybe 10 square miles. So, you know, very small communities. And I think that that really has helped the Boston area, you know, get better, you know, better infrastructure because, you know, there's just not one huge government that decides where everybody gets bike, bicycle infrastructure. It's each, you know, local government that, that can decide that. And then we see different approaches to bicycle infrastructure. So like we have the cycling safety ordinance in Cambridge that mandates the installation of protected bike lanes. And we have Boston's, you know, approach to just installing it, um, you know, as needed on the mayor's approach. And then uh, Somerville kind of has a hybrid of that. And we can see how that works for each community and then other communities in the suburbs can explore from that. MassDOT has also been a really important influence in, in our designs and across the state as well because they have what's called controlling criteria um, for their complete streets projects, which requires you know, projects that are getting reconstructed to you know, have protected bike lanes and have you know, bus lanes and have sidewalks. You know, all these things that should be standard, and it's really allowed you know projects all across the state. We're starting to see separated bike lanes, you know, just going up everywhere, and it's really that's how we're going to get that network because MassDOT's you know not going to fund projects without protected bike lanes, so we're going to have projects with protected bike lanes as they control the funding, and that's really powerful. Yeah. Okay, we've got a a, a nice rainbow here. <laughs> Yeah, this is just kind of right after the bike lane was installed. I think it was like the day after and I went for a walk and there was a rainbow and uh, it made me honestly pretty emotional just to see that, you know, that I'm like, it's just been such a, you know, it was such a wild process of Madison Appleton to get even, you know, this little bike lane installed after the tragedy. So it really meant, you know, a lot to me and it was just, you know, seeing bicyclists was the first warm day you know, using, using that lane. And now people feel safe to ride year round there too. So it's really, really, really special. And you can just see from this drone shot, just how odd that intersection really was. And, and it's, it's just so much safer now. And I believe the next photo even has like a sunset, you know, just it's, it's part, it's more part of, of the community now. And it just is a much safer intersection. Even drivers have, have said that this is a huge improvement. So it's really nice to have everybody come together and really support the solution. Well, I think that's a really good point, too, that you're making here is that, you know, when we create a safer environment, especially when we're dealing with a sort of an odd shaped uh, intersection like this, if we can bring motor vehicle speeds down, it's safer for everybody. Everybody benefits, including drivers. Exactly. And the visibility too. I mean, just having that bump out um, to the right next to the bike lane, you know, having people approach that intersection at that angle, they can see much better than they would have if they're coming down, you know, at the previous just, you know, you know, just angle, it was just much more, much more dangerous. And this, this really clarified every, all those movements. Um, And what was really exciting after that was, um, you know, after the short term project, the town decided to go forward with with reconstructing the corridor and I believe there's some photos in the slideshow that that show that design but it's a a sidewalk level protected bike lane just like the one on Western Avenue in Cambridge so so we go from having this short-term design and now we can go forward with starting construction next year of a fully protected bike lane on the sidewalk level gold standard and that's going to be constructed in the near future. 11 is my concept that I made first, and then 12 is the one that the engineer, engineering consultant made. So once the short term went in, I wanted to push forward, you know, like the town was, was going to do to get a reconstruction project going. So I, I made this diagram in Adobe Illustrator, and that was to show what we could have, you know, if we're doing a full reconstruction, we have all this space because the sidewalks are up for grabs. So obviously we don't want to shorten the width of sidewalks, but, but there's a lot more space there. So, you know, a lot more possibilities for traffic signalization and such. And, you know, I, I made this concept to show, you know, what a sidewalk level bike lane could look like here because the average rider on Massachusetts Avenue today is, or at least was, 
a, a cyclist, you know, kind of like a mammal per se, like a, a racing cyclist going very fast, not a, not someone who's biking for transportation, but more somebody like a weekend warrior type. And obviously we want to welcome those, those users too as bicyclists and keep them safe. But, but the overall goal is to, to induce a mode shift that allows people not just to use cars to get around or not just to walk, but also to use bicycles. And, and if we want people to feel safe biking, we need to, to provide them with protected bicycle facilities. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so you, you, you sketched this up, um, on Adobe illustrator, as you mentioned, and then what did you do with this? So I gave it to the town, um, the transportation planner at the time, Daniel Amstutz, he's a superstar. Um, and he was, you know, working on with the consultant Stantec to, to redesign this corridor. So I sent that design to him, you know, just to say, Hey, you know, this is really what we have, what we should do because we have the space for this. Cambridge has started to do it. Somerville has, you know, and we have the space and eventually that became one of the project goals. And even people who opposed the design, you know, previously were, you know, it made a lot of sense to them to have the parking protect the bike traffic. You know, they don't really, most of them are not against having bike lanes or having bicyclists. They just want to make sure that they're able to park too. So if we're able to have parking protected bike lanes where bicyclists can actually feel safer because there's parked cars separating them from the fast moving vehicles, you know, it's, it's kind of the perfect solution. Unfortunately, it did come with some parking removal, but I'm happy to say that this time after a parking study was done, the select board moved forward with the new proposal, even if it did remove some of the parking. So it kept all of the, you know, most utilized parking and it, and this is the design that Stantec made and they're refining it and adding in some more landscaping, which I'm really excited about. And it's going to be, it's just, you know, incredible transformation from what we had before. Um, you can still see it in the red with what the existing curb lines were and now just how it's tightened up and with the new protected bike lanes, it's, it's just going to be an amazing, you know, community asset. And I can't wait for that. Yeah. So when you handed it off to, uh, you know, the, the person at the town, uh, were you already a known quantity to him? Uh, was, did you guys already have a relationship ahead of time or, or did you kind of kept catch him off guard? So I actually met Daniel for the first time back in 2019. I was in eighth grade and the town was installing a a bus lane and I used the 77 a lot to get to school. So I saw a poster um, at a bus stop pole and I decided to go and that's where I met Daniel for the first time. So he's been with the town for a while. So I've known him from then, but, but, you know, flash forward to 2021 when we had the short-term design going on, I was engaged in that process and I would send a lot of feedback to Daniel and that's how we kind of developed a relationship. So by the time I had my concept, you know, reconstruction concept of, of sorts, um, we knew each other pretty well. So, um, it was good to have that good to know him already. He's, he's a great guy. Um, unfortunately not with the town anymore, but, um, he's doing great, great things too. And we also have a new transportation planner, John Alessi, and he's fantastic as well. So. That's great. So what year did you do this? So this I designed in 2021, 2022. I believe it was 2022. So, okay. yeah. so you know, a right couple after years the, ago. Yeah. the, right. Yeah. Two years ago now. So, you know, it started with the bike lane and then I decided to add in, you know, some landscape architecture, just, just some sort of design that could really reimagine the, the corridors as something more you know, bicycle and pedestrian friendly than, than what we have today. Because short term solutions are great and a lot of cities are, employing them because they're so easy to get out there. But obviously the long-term goal is to have, you know, what, what the Dutch have, having separated bike lanes on the sidewalks and, and bike signals and all those, you know, wonderful amenities that we, we can really have to transform our streets because we can make streets more bicycle friendly in the short term, but you don't really get the added benefits like landscaping that come from, you know, complete streets and, and Dutch style street design that we, that we really want to see. Yeah, yeah. And for those who uh, may have missed earlier, what age were you when you did this two years ago? Um, I would have been about 15 or 16. So, yeah, pretty young. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. I, I just I, I adore the fact that you were so inspired at such a young age to get engaged in this. And uh, yeah, I I. I'm stoked to, you know, continue following you and your career as you, uh, you move on. Uh, so, so this is the Stantec plan. They're working on, uh, improving it. Uh, what are we looking at here? This does not look like much fun. 
<laughs> yeah, so this is Massachusetts Avenue is a very long street. So, you know, it goes it's it's the center of town. Um we have two center of town streets. We have the bike trail, which is the Minuteman Bikeway, and then we have Mass Avenue. And a lot of times we hear in the town, oh, bicyclists can just use the Minuteman Bikeway. And, um, you know, that's just not the case. I would love to use the bike path to get around, but, you know, I'm trying to go to my high school. That's on Massachusetts Avenue. I'm trying to go to Town Hall. I'm trying to go to local businesses. All those places are on, on Massachusetts Avenue. And this photo, you know, shows what it's really like today. You know, we have a Shero. Okay, that's something, I suppose. But it's not really, really any protection. So I took this photo when I was biking home from school. Um, and it shows, you know, two, two people, you know, younger, younger child and, and a mother, I believe, you know, cycling on Massachusetts Avenue right next to the semi truck. Thankfully, you know, the traffic signals are no turn on red. So they, they have at least that, you know, pedestrian safety benefit. But, you know, it's not a comfortable place to ride. It's very dangerous. And I've had so many friends like get doored in this section of Massachusetts Avenue because people are just are not, you know, alert for cyclists and and you know, there, it just could be so much better. There's this, just an abyss of, of asphalt, and it's really – it doesn't even need – I mean, this truck, you can see it only takes up two-thirds of the lane. You know, there's, there's so much more space that, that we have there that we, that we could unlock. I mean, this, is, this lane is 14 feet wide. Right. Or actually, I believe it's 16 feet wide. It's looking that's, like it's more like 16, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's four feet wider than – interstate travel lanes. There's no reason that any lane should ever be that wide. It just induces people to drive faster and more dangerously. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to your point too, you know, it, because we were just looking at the, the, you know, the previous design that's going to be, you know, have the parking protected on here, you can really see how much more comfortable this would be for this parent and for this child if they were, you know, to the right of where the parked vehicles are. And so if we're able to, to sh shift those folks over. Absolutely. And in the next slide. Um, is this the, the, the likelihood for, for this or is that what the next slide is going to be? So the next slide is a, um, you know, that intersection, you know, that you can see kind of to the bottom right, that's the traffic signal that they were queuing up at. And this is a design that I made in my engineering class at school, which is um, computer-aided drafting and design for what this corridor could be like. So the town, unfortunately, hasn't, you know, begun a process to, to reconstruct or redesign this corridor yet, but we are, um, you know, looking at doing or the town is looking at doing road diets, you know, across the, across the, you know, where we have four lanes of traffic, because that's a lot of traffic to introduce bike lanes and other safer facilities. So, you know, the process is unfortunately slower than I'd like, but I yeah. think this is. <laughs> For sure. It always <laughs> is. Get used to that. Yep. You, young, you young whippersnapper. <laughs> yeah. It, it takes way longer than it should. Uh, and it's good for us to have a sense of urgency and it's a good, good for us to be able to keep pushing harder to make things happen faster. Um, is this a, is this stretch of the road? Is this a state owned road or is this owned by the uh, municipality? So this is owned by Arlington. Um, so, you know, so it's their responsibility we, to design it and upkeep it and, and all that. Okay. Right. Absolutely. Um, you know, there is kind of an interesting Massachusetts Avenue in general is like, while it's owned by the town, a lot of the grant funding that we go for or the town would go for if they were looking to reconstruct the street is complete streets funding. And that is the funding that is actually with the controlling criteria on bike lanes. And, you know, back when I was super young, like 20, 2013, 2014, the town was reconstructing the Massachusetts Avenue in the eastern part that bordered Cambridge. And there was a huge controversy over the design because the design was going to take a four lane road and bring it to three lanes. And there was a vote over it. There was a lot of like a, a, all of the Arlington voted over this proposal. There was a Save Massachusetts Avenue group. And ultimately, you know, the state said, we will not fund this project if you don't include bike lanes. And there are bike lanes there today. Obviously, we don't want to have to go to a point where, you know, there's a lot of controversy in the community. But at some point, you know, MassDOT or the roadway authority needs to take charge and say, hey, we need a safe street. We're not going to fund a dangerous design because people have died. And I think that, that what MassDOT did there was really appropriate. And I think that it saved a lot of lives. When MassDOT did that at that time, uh, was there any qualitative uh 
context in terms of you must have bike lanes? Is it back then was just a painted bike lane enough or was was the the barrier there that it needed to be a high comfort, some form of separated or protected bike lane? So unfortunately, it was, you know, just a standard um, buffered bike lane. So it wasn't the high high comfort facility that we'd want today. I don't believe parking protected bike lanes, you know, I, I don't even think we had one in the state at that point, which is which is unfortunate. I mean, that's really, it, when when you think of it, you know, Petro, I mean, it, this is an indication of just how far along we have come just in the last decade here in North America. I mean, obviously, we're decades and decades behind uh, the Netherlands. But, you know, it's it, it, in my realm, in the, in the amount of time that I've been active working in this, I'm seeing just a sea change of momentum towards getting away from just a paint you know, painted bike lane uh, towards some form of physical protection, separation. We both have mentioned uh, Western Avenue where, you know, you're, you're literally grade separated and, uh, you know, having the ability to, to have uh, some parking protection too. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. You know, I'm young, so I don't really have that same concept of of time because, you know, everything seems like, you know, a long time between. Well, I, for disagree. Me, I, I disagree. Even in your <laughs> young life, you have seen a huge sea change. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess you're right. Um, you know, but, you know, just going from standard bike lanes being, you know, the, the default treatment to having, you know, protected bike lanes be the new treatment that that seems to be used everywhere and even in, uh, embraced by state DOTs. Like that's that's just amazing how fast that, that that's happened, that transformation. Because, you know, we were, it was, you know, that was a strange design that would, even in 2013, 2014, when that project was designed, I don't think that there was a single protected bike lane in in Massachusetts. So I really, you know, grateful that, you know, certain practitioners and planners took that on to try to make, you know, make that early investment. It's great to be, to live next to Cambridge because they, they were doing protected bike lanes back in 2003. So, you know, they were they were fully built, but, you know, it was still having that, that resource and, you know, people from Arlington could go to Cambridge and they'd be like, wow, you know, this really makes a lot of sense having the bike lane on the sidewalk, you know, and just having that cultural shift in Cambridge has really, you know, helped Arlington surrounding communities embrace, you know, safer streets design. Yeah. I mean, as, as taxpayers, you know, you, you, you don't want to feel like, oh, when you cross, you know, the border from Cambridge into Arlington, you, you feel like you are second class citizens. You know, you, it's like, no, we need to keep up with them. You know, it's the Cambridge. Effect. <laughs> and that is how it do- and that is how it feels today. So, um, you know, you know, we're working on it, though. So it's it's going to be it's going to be a lot better. Yeah, it's it, it's interesting, too. Uh, we could call that the Cambridge effect. You know, it's it's they've because the of the progress that they have made, they've had an impact on Somerville uh, trying to catch up. And then obviously, uh, you know, having both Somerville and Cambridge next to you, it's it's having an impact on what's happening there in Arlington. As I mentioned earlier, you guys are all three of you are having an impact on what's happening in Boston. I used to look when when I lived in in Boulder in the 1990s. We have an a, amazing network of off street pathways, and uh, in in Boulder that you know have been in place since the 1970s, or, or that's when they got started in building out the off street network of pathways, and that had a huge impact on other cities in Boulder County because and I used to call that the Boulder effect. You know, it's like People wanted to have similar stuff. They'd see what was available in Boulder and say, well, why can't we have that? And so you do have that impact on the surrounding communities, which I think is a really good thing. And I think that that's an, an absolutely great point about bike trails. You know, Arlington, you know, we got a bike trail that goes right through the center of town as kind of a spine to the bicycle network you know, back in 19, in the 1990s. And I think that if we didn't have that bike trail, I don't think that we'd have any bicycle infrastructure in the town, maybe a couple painted lanes, but nothing like what we have today, because people, if, you know, you become a bicycle community, if you have a bike trail like that, yeah. you know, high quality and safe and, you know, within, you know, a quarter mile of almost everybody's house, because, because the town is so small, that people, you know, biking is more normalized and people commute by bikes. And then that kind of shifts into allowing people to, to see bicyclists more as like your neighbors than just like weekend warrior types that you would never, never know or talk to. And I think that that's really the Miniman bikeway itself, you know, not just in Arlington, but across its entire, 
entire length into Lexington as well has really inspired a lot more bicycle infrastructure because people want to connect to that trail and it you know really widens the the um, you know pers- the, the amount of people who want to and feel safe to ride a bike so it's it's really really nice to have trails like that I think that that it, it really transforms the entire community when you have a bike trail in ways that people you know wouldn't really think that it would yeah yeah so what's what's going on here with this particular image it looks like we've got a, a fairly large uh, intersection is this a continuation of what we were looking at earlier so this is Route 16 in Somerville. Um, so this is a, an, another project that I was um, involved in on the advocacy side. So Route 16 is a four-lane wide, um, 40-foot highway that just kind of you know runs right through Somerville and Arlington. It, it borders, it, you know, it kind of creates the border between the two communities. Um, and recently, there's been a push to to you know make it a lot safer. As you can see, this is a um, pedestrian only phase and you can see people crossing the street but it's just there's a lot of cars and it feels really unsafe and people can turn on red and people drive extremely fast the roadway is extremely narrow Um, the lanes are actually less than 10 feet wide which in some ways is nice because it means people drive a lot slower but you know in reality people still drive really fast it well, yeah, just I feel mean, really I uncomfortable mean, you, doing it. <laughs> yeah, you you know this. I mean, this is this is the absolute worst design, you know, from a safety perspective. It's it's like four lanes, and so uh, yes, it's uh, hey, kudos. And I'm assuming this is a state highway, correct? Yes, this yeah, one is. So, so this is a state highway. Um, so this is MassDOT. And, you know, kudos to them for at least having incredibly narrow lanes. But the reality is, is whenever you have four lanes, you you constantly, as a driver, you're constantly sort of jockeying and you're going from one lane to the next and you're you're trying to maximize the amount of speed because, you you, you know, you're human. You, you want to try to decrease the amount of time that you're having to drive because, let's face it, driving is not that much fun. And so, so uh, these, in fact, are some of the most dangerous street designs that we can have are four lane roadways, uh, strodes and four lane highways. Uh, so, yeah, it's I, I can totally see that even though it's narrow lanes, you still see some pretty high speeds. Right. Four lane roads are extremely dangerous because there's no turn lanes and there's no space and people to really drive fast. So this was kind of this Broadway intersection was kind of the start. Um, to you know the whole coalition to improve and road diet road diet the corridor and you know one thing we looked at was we had a walk and talk and this is um, Jeff Perenni. Um he's the, the uh, chief tra- he was the chief deputy chief traffic engineer for the DCR um, so something interesting about Massachusetts is that we have um, an agency Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation that actually owns several roadways in in Massachusetts in the greater area. Um, so we have MassDOT, but we have a secondary you know, state agency of TCR um, that also controls roadways, except they have a lot less funding and they interact with a lot of communities, especially closer to the Boston area. And their roadways are a lot, a lot more narrow and a lot more dangerous because they're, they're often that four lane, nine and a half foot wide design. That's, that's really dangerous. So you know, one thing we did is we invited them on this walk and talk. And, you know, when we got to this crosswalk, you know, I had already done some research on it. And I know that the intersection had, you know, the intersection was Aylesburg Parkway and Broadway. And Broadway was 44 feet wide. So the METCD, the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, has a stipulation that when you provide a crosswalk with the flashing countdown, you need to provide three and a half feet per second of crossing speed. Um, that makes it so everybody can cross the street really safely and have enough time to do so. But this intersection did not give enough crossing crossing time. It only gave about eight seconds of crossing time. And that left a lot of people, you know, stranded because they actually deserved five more seconds. So um, when we went on this walk, um, Jeff and I were talking, and I pointed this out to him, and he had a, cab- a key to the traffic signal cabinet and actually changed the signal timing right there. Um, to make it make it safer for pedestrians um, immediately, and it was it was pretty awesome. You can see Brad Rawson; um, he's the director of transportation for the city of Somerville, um, looking on with Jeff, seeing that that um, change being being made. It was it was pretty surprising, and we actually did the same change at another intersection on the walk too. So, you know, added five seconds to two crosswalks, and it was pretty awesome. 
Yeah, it was pretty awesome. And, and, and you were one happy dude, you know, yay, there's a, <laughs> there's a big, huge smiley face. <laughs> yeah, no, it yeah, was Good work cool, for you, man. You're, you're, uh, you're, you're making a, a difference on that. So let's, let's start talking about uh, left on green arrow only. What are, we, uh, what are we talking about here? Well, this is, you know, kind of the vision we started with for Broadway. Um, so our goal was to have protected only lefts and left turn only leans. And this was, you know, the first slide that we made on that. And if you go to the next slide, um, you can actually see how that kind of transformed into another diagram. So we take that four lane Aylwick Brook Parkway and we make it, you know, down to three lanes, but we have a left turn only lane. And our argument was, you know, we already have effectively a road diet every single cycle because nobody drives in the left lane because they're worried that they're going to get stuck behind a driver turning left. And when you're stuck behind a driver turning left, it, it's terrible. I mean, you have to put your blinker on and, you know, try to get to the right, but there's tons of cars in the right turn lane. Nobody's going to let you in. It's Boston. So, you know, it's just a, a lose-lose situation. So, you know, if we already have that effective road diet, we may as well just stripe it and make it safer for everybody by providing those, you know, dedicated left turn phases and, and the through, you know, and adding in bus lanes on the side street too, because we have that extra space. Yeah. Yep. Fascinating so, stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's a pretty, pretty exciting project. And this is just a single plan that I developed for that intersection. So yeah, it's a, it's a great project and um, I'm excited that the city of Somerville is going to move forward with it. I think it's going to, you know, really transform the, uh, you know, the community, if that, if that goes in to make it a lot, a whole lot safer. Yeah. So obviously you're very passionate about signals and signalization and, and being able to optimize that. We talked about that earlier and we talked about the Netherland effect of, of, you know, being able to do that. But in many cases in the Netherlands, they almost, depending on the context, they almost feel like if we're, if we're having to put in a signal, we're, we're not doing our job well. And, you know, one of my favorite things to see, you know, happen. And one of the things that I, you know, when I first visited the Netherlands back in 2015 was being able to realize that, oh, based on the, the, the traffic volumes and the number of people driving, the number of people walking, the number of people uh, riding bikes, we may not need any signalization. We may, you know, may, maybe this could be a, you know, a low speed uh, roundabout, you know, type of situation with protection for people crossing, you know, walking and biking. And that's the one thing that, that, that I wish would take off here in North America more is, you know, taking some of these, you know, these intersections, these roadways and saying, well, what if we didn't have any signals here? What if we actually had a situation where it's, you know, you know, because you, you mentioned it earlier, one of the biggest frustrations of people driving is when they're, you know, stuck behind somebody uh, trying to turn, uh, you know, they're stuck at a light. Why are we here at this light? There's nobody else around. Again, a, a, a small footprint roundabout with a 15 mile an hour per, you know, per hour design, one lane in each direction. A lot of that is just completely saved without having any signalization, which, as you well know, saves, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in infrastructure and ongoing programming, you know, uh, you know, from, from, from that standpoint. Um, I hope I'm not, you know, saying anything that's like controversial for you since you're, you're so passionate about signals, but in my <laughs> mind, the best, the, the best, you know, design is one that doesn't even need signals. Yeah. I mean, I, I'd like to think that that would be, you know, obviously if you think about an intersection that's very pedestrian friendly, you don't see any cars, you know, it's just pedestrians and, and pedestrians and bicyclists, they don't really need traffic signals. In the Netherlands, there are a lot of traffic signals that have bike only phases because all the bicyclists can just go all at once because, you know, they don't really need traffic signals. We can kind of, you know, figure it out on our own, you know, make eye contact and just, you know, we just have that, that way that you know, drivers just will never, you know, it will never be that way with cars. Yeah. Um, well, and, and, and to your, and to your point too, you know, sticking on, on the Netherlands and we're, we're looking at a, a nice Dutch, uh, looks like an urban arrow here, uh, in, in frame in this particular image. And earlier we saw, you know, the image with the Sharrow, you know, the, the Sharrow that was right down there on, on Massachusetts Avenue with the, uh, the truck. 
And, you know, we when we take a step back and we think about the Dutch network and we think about, you know, the the massive number of roads that have, you know, really no signalization to it. They don't have stop signs. Uh, these are almost always, you know, paved in either red pavement or red bricks. And it's it's a slow speed environment. So it's a 30 kilometer per hour environment, which equates uh, to just about 17 miles per hour. And you don't need traffic control devices because, uh, you know, motor vehicles that are there are traveling at a reasonable speed and the design reinforces the reasonable speed. They don't need a whole bunch of signs and signals and, and all of that. The design dictates that. And so I like to point that out when we talk about, you know, cycling infrastructure. It's like, yeah, you know, 70 percent, 60 to 70 percent of a typical Dutch city is some form of shared space where, uh, to your point, it's, you know, maybe there are some motor vehicles, but they're not there in overwhelming numbers and they're certainly not driving fast. Yeah. And, you know, that's a huge that's a huge difference. Because we have, you know, we may have some low traffic streets, but unfortunately, American drivers are not like Dutch drivers. You know, they are more angry. A lot of them just do not like cyclists. And that is really scary um, if you've ever experienced that kind of behavior, aggressive behavior behind you. You know, I've been on a bicycle priority street in Cambridge and, and have had people, you know, aggressively tailgate and honk at me. And it's like, well, there are signs that say I can use the full lane. I'm over a Shero. And this is not a street for you. So I think that, you know, one of the biggest changes we, we need is a cultural shift. You know, we need, you know, people think streets are, are for cars. That's not the case anymore. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> and, and we talk about the, yes, we do need a cultural shift and we do need that reinforcement of, uh, you know, better driving behavior. And it is frustrating to be a driver in an environment where, let's face it, you know, the, the problem, of course, in, in, urban, in urban environments is that it's very, very frustrating to drive around because the more people who drive, the less satisfying that experience gets. And so that brings us right back full circle to, well, what can we do to create networks of alternatives and options so that, you know, really the only people who are left driving are the people who absolutely need to, absolutely want to, <laughs> you know, and, you know, for other people, because again, many of these trips that we're talking about, especially in this little circle of areas there in the Boston area, many of these trips are just inherently bikeable distances. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think that, I think that to get that done, you know, you need to look at Cambridge and, and, you know, see the cycling safety ordinance. You know, having something in law that, you know, says we need to have protected bike lanes on the street no matter what. Everything else can be decided later. That is the type of conversation of, you know, device that can really force conversations that we need to have about making our streets safer. Um, because ultimately, you know, we're kind of at the hardest point. We have some streets that have, you know, bike lanes and they're built for, you know, bikes and for have bus lanes and they're built for buses. Um, you know, and that, you know, makes an, a worse driver experience sometimes, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it's, it's great for everybody. But, you know, when we have, you know, only a couple, you know, really great bike lanes and they're not connected to each other, people are not going to be able to switch their commute because there's still that one intersection or that one, you know, section where I'm in a Shero and I feel really unsafe. You know, people, you know, we need it to be everywhere. If it's not everywhere, then there's gaps and people won't feel safe. And so now we just have, we're in this, you know, liminal period where we have a lot of streets for cars still. And then we have some bike streets and, and that's when people really get angry because we're not at a, at a place, you know, we're seeing a mode shift, a, a mode shift slowly, you know, it's happening, but it's not happening, you know, as fast as, as, you know, some people would want it to. And that's because, you know, we can't infrastructure, like build the infrastructure as quickly as we want to. So, you know, if Cambridge is, you know, solution, they're going to have their network done by 2026. Right. So we're almost there. And once that's done, then I think that that's really going to, to change, change the, the conversation in the community. 
Um, because, you know, I mean, even Cambridge just got sued over their bike lanes, um, you know, over the cycling safety ordinance. And, and ultimately that, that was thrown out, um, you know, because it, it's just not, you know, not the case. Well, but, haters but, are going to hate. It, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's sad to have, you know, that that controversial you know element. You know, my dad gets gets his hair cut at this um, very anti-bike um, haircut place in Cambridge that was along one of the sections that got a bus lane. And I think I have a photo of it. If you just go to, to the right, it might be the next slide even. Um, nope, one more. One more. Yeah, there it is. So yeah, you can see the street. It has, it used to be parking, driving lane, driving lane, driving lane, driving lane, parking. So the city decided that that was unsafe. We have the cycling safety ordinance. We need to change this. There's a deadline. And they brought in the bike lanes. And while they're already redesigning the street, they may as well put in the bus lane. And this bus lane has extremely good compliance. I'm not really sure why. I think it's because there's good enforcement and you know people are, are usually pretty good at following traffic laws around here. But you know the bus lane is usually empty of cars, and, and it's just there for buses. I and mean, you can even see in this photo that there's nobody in the bus lane, and there's a bus coming. And you know that's you know my dad still goes there, and he even bikes there. And you know sometimes the the conversations that he has to overhear are, are tough because people are just you know really upset at the bike at the bus lanes and the bike lanes. And he's like, well, my son like you know helped work on work on these projects, and it's like, and he even bikes. I mean, he bikes to get his haircut there. You know, so it's it's just kind of weird how, you know, people are so angry about all these different designs. And when some of their customers are, in fact, cyclists and, and overall, I think that they're even if biking is not for them, it could be for other people, too. So Cambridge's model is, is really difficult. And I'm not sure other, if other communities are ready to take that on yet. I think Cambridge is ex- uber, you know, progressive and, and liberal and other communities that, that don't don't have that type of politics, political identity it, it might not happen for them, but but hopefully, you know, we can get to a point where building separated bike lanes is is the norm. And I think we're getting there. I really yeah. do. Well, and, and it's honestly, at the end of the day, we know this from the experience around the globe. It's like building safe and inviting all ages and abilities networks for everybody, where everybody is safer, everybody um, feels like they have mobility choice. It's actually good for business. And so at some point in time, this should not be a, a right versus left, you know, conservative versus progressive issue at all. It's, it's actually good for business. It's good for the public health. It's good for, literally, it's good for everybody. In other words, active towns are good for everybody. Yes. <laughs> so, regardless of your politics. Exactly. I want to go back a couple of images uh, to, to, to this image here where, where we were kind of paused for a second because... It, it occurs to me that this is a, a really good image that, you know, sort of speaks to what we were talking about earlier, too, of, you know, that, you know, so so we've got the the mammals represented there. You know, we've got the, the dude in, in the lycra, but you also have just a person who's de- dressed for her destination. You know, she's just on her relaxed, upright bike. and she's, No helmet, you know, just a no chill helmet. bike. And, exactly. And a great a bicycle chill bike. Lane. Yeah. And, and doing it. And this is not an ideal piece of infrastructure. This is needs to be redone, obviously. But I did want to hone in on the fact that, yeah, and we even have a bike signal here. Boom. Yeah. So this was, um, you know, this project is the Porter Square project. um, That was extremely controversial, even though it was, you know, less than 0.25 miles in length. Um, So, you know, the city wanted to, you know, fast track safer bike lanes in Porter Square, because a lot of people got doored there, it was very unsafe. And, you know, I came in at this, you know, from somebody who bikes into this area, and I felt like this intersection was extremely dangerous. There are a ton of vehicles that turn left and right. So left turning vehicles, I believe there's over 152 an hour, right turning vehicles, 375 an hour. That is a lot of turning vehicles. Um, Can I say something real quick about the number of vehicles and the number of turning vehicles just to Mm -hmm. to, so that we can kind of hone in on something that's related to what we were talking about earlier is that if we are able to get truly safe and inviting facilities in place. And this is one of the things that I like to emphasize with, you know, uh, in traffic engineers and people who are are looking at current traffic levels and they're thinking about the future is like 
stop. Don't worry about how many people are driving now and turning now and all of that, other than the context of let's build the environment that we want to have. What do we want, you know, regardless of how many vehicles are in here right now, think about, and in, in other words, oftentimes they say, no, 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 we can't do that because of X number of traffic, you know, turning vehicles and all this kind of stuff, et cetera. I, I'm like, time out. Let's, let's really stay focused on, do you want this to be a, a place where an eight-year-old is going to be able to ride her bike, you know, to get to school or to the park, et cetera? And if the answer to that is yes, then, then we really do need to get beyond trying to support the movement of, you know, the vehicles per se, because- Absolutely. Yeah. Ultimately- the way that induced demand works with capacity when it comes to, to motor vehicles, and we can see the same thing with active transportation, is that if you build it, they will fill it up. And that's exactly what's happening. There, there, there's that many vehicles turning there and are occupying that space because it's been built and it's been prioritizing their movement. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think that that's something that the city of Cambridge does well is that, you know, you know, the traffic counts there. You know, they're not going to say, okay, we're, we're going to take out, you know, the bike lane, we're going to put in a, a turn lane. No, they're going to say, wait a second, that's a lot of conflicts. Because we have so many conflicts, we need to give bicyclists their protected phase so that they are not, you know, getting, you know, in, you know, harm's way because drivers are failing to turn to them. And hopefully they get beyond just a protected phase and they get to the point of, you know, because right now it's, it's clear that as they, they may have a protected phase in terms of being able to get across. But again, this is a great opportunity. This could be a protected bike lane, uh, you know, parking protected bike lane here. And that's exactly what the city is, is planning on doing, which is really exciting. Um, but yeah, this, this uh, leading interval, I, I kind of, you know, reached out to the city about and, you know, Andreas Wolf, he's, he's one of the project managers for the city of Cambridge. And, and he and I met at the intersection and, you know, discussed it and saw the hazards and decided that they were going to push forward with this new signal timing. I'm laughing. I'm laughing, Petru, because you're already having a huge impact on your community. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even after this design went in, you know, it still wasn't safe enough. Honestly, you know, there's no protection at this intersection. You know, you're, you know, you, because we have these bump outs, you know, it's, it's a quick build project. You can't build around the bump outs. Yeah. It's still, a, it's still a strode. You know, when you look at this, this is still highway designs and multiple, multiple lanes. Yep. So I'm excited that the city is going to, you know, be redesigning this corridor just in the next year. I mean, they're in the process of doing it now and it's going to have bus lanes, protected bike lanes and protected intersections. And that's going to be something we can all look forward to. Looking at this, and, this is, yeah, this is some, this is some, you know, bicyclists in, in Cambridge, you know, just enjoying a new protected bike lane. Um, Brattle street is one of the most interesting projects that just was built this year. I also work, um, you know, helped advocate for traffic signal phasing at this intersection. So I, you know, the left, this is a two way cycle track, which, you know, goes back to our earlier conversations about how those, you know, have their own set of risks because bicyclists are traveling in both directions. Right. The original design was to provide, you know, not provide any protected phase for drivers and drivers turning left. We're supposed to look for oncoming drivers, bicyclists coming this way, bicyclists coming the other way and pedestrians. And, you know, an average driver is just not going to be able to handle that much information, unfortunately. You know, it's just not going to work out. So the solution here was to provide a dedicated left turn arrow. And that means that these bicyclists don't have to worry about drivers turning left um, while they proceed. They have their own protected phase. And no turn on red. Yes, absolutely. Nice. Um, nice. The whole city of Cambridge, <laughs> actually, um, you know, I worked with Councillor Zeem and Councillor Mallon. At the time, I believe it was back in 2022 when I introduced this idea of, you know, saying, hey, we have a lot of no turn on red signs, but we need to ban it citywide. So that was something legislatively that I, I got involved in and with this policy order for no turn on red. Um, and a lot of cities are, are doing this, you know, Ann Arbor, Michigan, yep. Seattle, Washington, uh, Washington, D.C., 
I want to say, gosh, in the, I want to say in the last six months, I mean, it's, I've been hearing no turn on red. Let's push for this. Let's push for this. So yeah. Yeah. It's, it's I think a lot amazing. of advocates are realizing that, you know, no turn on red signs, they're fairly cheap and they yield a lot of safety benefits. Especially if you also get the policy change too, especially if exactly. you get the policy change at a high enough level um, in there. Uh, so we've, we've got signal separation on this one. Uh, talk through this image. So this is this is a really cool design because this you know as you can see further down you can see that you know beautiful sidewalk level protected bike lane yeah look um, at this. with the trees um, but signal separation is something I've really championed and and you know or really advocated for a lot in in the past couple of years um, and this is basically having a bike signal and a right turn signal and saying drivers you can't turn right when the bikes are going through and the pedestrians are walking. Um, it's something that was introduced to me at a very young age, just because this type of phasing was very uncommon and still kind of is across the U.S., but my town actually was one of the first installers of, of this type of phasing back at our old intersection back in, you know, there was a woman who got hit by a car who was turning right on a green light and she had a walk sign and they ran out and ran into her and she broke, broke her leg. And she started protesting every day that the town needs to change the traffic signal pattern. So they, you know, looked into it and they looked into this type of phasing that was, you know, up and coming with the protected right turn arrow and they installed it. And now it's becoming a, a more common treatment, you know, not just in Cambridge, but, but also, you know, nationwide. So Inman Square has this type of treatment. You know, anywhere you have a high volume amount of right turn vehicles, you know, there is, you know, obviously we can use protected intersections, but at some point you need to separate out that movement. And that's something that, you know, happens here in the U.S., but not just here, but in the Netherlands too. And having that signal separation can be installed fairly easily compared to the installation of a constructed, constructed element like a protected intersection like we have here in Inman Square. <laughs> so, yeah, this is another signal separated intersection, but I mean, Inman Square is just gorgeous. Yeah. You were incredibly excited when this hall was coming down with Inman Square because you were, I was seeing on social media your posts on this. And, and I can remember being here in Inman Square uh, back in 2019. Uh, yeah. W what a great, great thing to see, you know, this, you know, get taken care of and, and, and put in place. Talk a little bit about why this project was just so important and impactful. Inman Square is, you know, one of my, we used to be one of my least favorite intersections, and now it is, you know, my favorite intersection in all of Massachusetts and the United States. It, you know, it was just this really convoluted mess before. We just had this, you know, wide intersection. It felt so dangerous. There was a lot of green paint that was installed, um, and you were just on that green paint conflict zone just for for ages. It felt like, yeah, the project was not started by a fatality, but it was kind of insane the way it unfolded. So this was before I really got into the advocacy scene and was aware about, you know, these improvements in Cambridge, but but there was an, you know, a meeting to improve the safety of Inman Square, a lot of controversy. And the very next day, um, a woman biking from her job in Inman Square home was doored um, by a, a driver come and then thrown into traffic and run over by a truck and was killed. The very next day after the meeting, so that really started the process of, you know, redesigning this extremely dangerous, dangerous intersection. And, you know, Cambridge had their Vision Zero policy and they needed to act, act with it. Um, so this project, it just, you know, I love traffic signals as well. And I'm really passionate about, you know, Dutch style traffic signals. And I think that this is really, you know, as close as we've gotten in America so far to Dutch style, Dutch style traffic signal design. You know, we have those near side four inch bike signals, you know, like you see in the Netherlands. And then, you know, the other thing that's wonderful about Inman Square is that there's a ton of bicyclists already. And I think that since the design has been installed, a lot more people are starting to bike there as well. So you can see in this photo just how many people are just biking up, up the street, um, you know, freshly installed, you know, project. And it's just so much, it's just a totally different intersection and vibe. There's a lot more community space. You know, there's this awesome 12 foot tall deer that's so random and I just love it. I mean, it's just so cool to have, to have all this, you know, greenery and, and it really just feels more like a place, less of just a, a 
you know, a thing that you go through. There's the you know, deer. It's a place I want to stop. Yeah, there's the deer. It's just somewhere you want to stop and look around. And, and I think it's totally, you know, it really shows how you can take one of those really weird Massachusetts intersections and, and twist it and turn it and redesign it and introduce new public space and all sorts of, you know, really awesome, awesome elements that can totally transform the intersection and make it safer too. Yeah. And, and to your point, you know, looking at the deer here and the, the public space that here is we're taking what was, you know, probably you know, previously just a whole bunch of overbuilt auto sewer space, you know, where you're just like pushing traffic through and you're making a place, you're creating a square, Inman Square. It's in the name. Yes. So important. exactly. Yeah. And, you know, Inman Square before it was just, yeah, you can even see really well in this photo, like you have to turn now to get around the new public space. Previously, if you can imagine it, you would just drive right through, you know, straight on through this, through this intersection. And that's that's just not how it is anymore. Um, You know, some drivers have complained about it, of course, and as they will. But, you know, really everybody walking around, it's just a much more happy environment. And, you know, once this landscaping grows, I'm really excited to see, see what it will be like. And there's me taking a, a little selfie with the, the new four inch near side bike signal. I just, I just love it. It's so awesome to have that, that, that style of design. I really think that that's, it's really cool. And also just, you feel, it feels more people oriented. Like when you see these huge traffic signals a million feet tall, you know, you don't really feel safe, but when you have something more human sized, people sized, it just feels, it feels more comfortable. You feel like you're meant to be there. And that's really important. Yeah. And, and to your point too, you know, we referenced it, you know, the near side, um, more Dutch style, uh, traffic signal, uh, approach to it. And, um, I would love to see you know, get sticking with your, your area of passion with signals. Um, I'd love to see North America uh, embrace that concept of near side traffic signals, even for motor vehicles too, because that 100%. really would actually help kind of counteract the fact that when we have the, the signals far side on the other side of the intersection, what we end up seeing is, is motor vehicle drivers creeping up and creeping into the crosswalk because they can still see the light. But if the, if it was near side traffic signals, they'd have to stay back behind the stop bar uh, and not cr- encroach up because then they wouldn't be able to see the signal. So. Exactly. Yeah, I think that that is something that we're going to have to see see going into the future. Not just you know supplemental near side signals, but fully near side signals. And if we talk about no turn on red compliance, if we have near side signals, drivers will be less likely to turn on red illegally or just turn on red at all because it feels more uncomfortable. So there's a, there's a lot of, ben- of benefits to near side traffic signals. Like there's a there's a video maybe maybe you can link it down below that I really love by um, Ontario Traffic Man. He's this yeah. he's this great YouTuber. Yeah. I don't know if you've Oh, You've yeah, talked to him before, but he's yeah, a great, no, he's, he's a great he, guy. He's awesome. Super traffic signal nerd. <laughs> yeah, he's traffic signal nerd. He now works for Mobicon. Uh, yeah, definitely. Right, right. We'll, we'll, we'll get that. Uh, we'll get that into the the show notes. Uh, you know, we need to wrap this up. We've we've been ta- talking for about seventy five minutes, and uh, is I'll give you the last word. Is there anything that we haven't covered that you just want to mention uh, you know, to the audience before we say goodbye? You know, I think. You know, honestly, I think that we've had a, a great conversation. I feel like almost everything, everything we talked about has, has you know, been what I wanted to discuss. But I, I guess I would end with just don't be afraid to get involved and, you know, nerd out over transportation infrastructure. Yeah. It seems really intimidating and it, it definitely was at the start, but it's really, really special when you can get introduced into advocacy circles. And once you learn more, you can also gain some sort of respect with traffic engineers and transportation practitioners so you can try to you know have better better designs because ultimately we're not the netherlands yet but maybe we will be if we have more people advocating in their communities about getting safer infrastructure even if it it gets you know advocacy burnout is real i've I've definitely felt felt it with with mass and appleton you know whether it's you know, the select board voting on a proposal for the design, you know, while I, it's a school night and nobody told me about it and just feeling so frustrated. Um, but the work that you do as an advocate, it's just so, so important or any, you know, any sort of advocacy or, you know, you know, like what you do, John, just spreading awareness about the importance for 
complete streets and active towns. It's, it's really important. And we're well on our way to having these beautiful networks of protected bike lanes and safe streets, but we still need a lot of help. So if you're able to get involved in your local community's advocacy organizations, I think that that would mean a lot. And there's great people you can meet through that and just anything you can do to help. It just means your impact will be enormous and it's, it's just going to make a much better society. So that would be my, my parting, parting word to, to folks watching. Uh, get involved. It's great. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and I'll say this, you know, I, I, I talked about this with uh, Joshua Funches uh, recently mm-hmm. uh, in an interview. And, uh, you know, we talked about the fact that, yes, don't forget about getting more youth involved in this. Uh, you are a great testament to this. And, and he and I had talked about the fact that the younger members of our society have some really interesting and uh and valuable perspectives to to give so uh for anybody you know tuning in listening to this watching this if you are younger don't be shy you know get engaged get you know get going yeah you 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 know the the powers that may be may give you a little bit of difficulty they may not take you seriously but stay the course to to your point and absolutely very well said yeah yes good stuff Petru, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Thank you, John. This was, yeah, this was fantastic. Um, I hope you'll have me back at some point. <laughs> definitely, definitely. And look forward to following your career. Uh, do you know at this point uh, where you're going to be heading uh, for, for college? Still considering a lot of options, okay. but um, excited to look into that. Yes, fantastic. Keep us posted. Will do. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Petru Sophia. And if you did, please, hey, give it a thumbs up. Leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the Active Towns channel. Just click on the subscription button down below and ring that notifications bell. And if you are enjoying this content here on the Active Towns channel, please consider supporting my efforts. It's easy to do. You can do it through YouTube Super Thanks right down below, (laughs) as well as uh, buy me a coffee and Patreon. Patreon supporters, by the way, uh, do have access to all of my video content uh, ad-free and early. So there is that benefit. Uh, And also, uh, don't forget, we've got plenty of good stuff out in the Active Town store. Streets are for people, swag, all sorts of good stuff, uh, as well as uh, support for the nonprofit is much appreciated. Uh, Until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.